Take a person, take a story, take you on a journey It's your take On today's Your Take, I'm joined by a well-known interior designer who has graced our television screen since 1996. My guest starred on the popular home improvement television series, Changing Rooms, for six years. Her popularity led her to other presenting duties before going on to design and advertise sofas for DFS and cabins for Thompson Holidays, making a yoga DVD appearing in front of the cameras for magazine shoots and starring in the second series of I'm a Celebrity, Get Me Out of Here. She brought her own wallpaper range and participated in Tom Daly's primetime TV show, Splash. She now publishes design books, writes a column for the Weekend Daily Express magazine, and has recently launched a collection of fabrics, curtains and blinds. Today, I talked to Linda Barker about her early life, her success, and what the future might bring. Lovely to see you. Thank you kindly, Thank you. and welcome to your take. Thank you very much. Thanks for the, um, the interview at the beginning, that, those lovely words. Thank you kindly. No, uh, a pleasure. We're obviously going to talk about your career and just in that mini biography alone, I've missed out several other things you've done as well throughout your career, but you've done so, so much. But I think the good starting point would be to go back to the very beginning, turn the clock back to the early 1960s. You were born in 1961. And I just wanted to specifically talk about your upbringing, you were born in a, a small village in West Yorkshire called Shelf on the outskirts of Bradford. Can you just tell us about your family life and just kind of your earliest childhood memories? Well, it was pretty idyllic, actually. Um, I grew up, like you say, with um, three sisters and a brother, five children, my mum and dad, um, on a farm. So it was very rural, but yet we were massively connected to those massive cities. Both Bradford and Halifax were equidistant away from Shelf, literally Shelf at the, at the top of the hill. Um, and it was a glorious, really glorious childhood. It was uh, very much uh, based on outdoors, um, a lot of freedom. Um, I remember just being kind of immersed in nature a lot as a young child, lots of water, lots of, um, uh, my dad grew lots of vegetables. We had big gardens and lawns and always kind of bike, bicycling, running around, walking lots. Um, we would walk loads actually, walk a lot. Things that have still stayed with me water immersion massively it's something i have always done all my life and do now i've done it this morning gone into the river um and that freedom was immense really um so it was a very very happy childhood um and then um schooling was just the local infant school that i walked to probably a mile and a half away two miles away um and then later went to uh, a grammar school Bradford Girls Grammar School uh, until I finished my A-levels. Um, so we didn't move, we stayed in the same uh, farm. Um, and it was, it, yeah, it was great. It was a very traditional family, I guess. You never know any other, do you? I didn't think it was unusual to have, you know, three sisters and a brother, but of course that is pretty unusual. Um, you know, lots of us. Um, sometimes freaks people out when we all meet together. Um, but that it just felt completely normal, a completely happy childhood pairing around the farm. I wanted to pick up on your education because you mentioned going to Bradford Girls Grammar School. I wanted to ask you what your memories are during your time there. 
Um, were you a, a natural academic? And did this kind of bring out and nurture your kind of creative flair whilst you were there? Um, it was a, it was an academic school. I wouldn't say I was particularly academic. I kind of just got through it, really. I, it was, in terms of my happiness in my school years, um, I mean, I got my joy from sport and from art. Um, I, um, I had some lovely friends there. Um, but it wasn't a joyous time for me, school. Um, I felt as if perhaps it, you know, I, I, I don't know. It, the academia wasn't for me. Bizarrely, I love it more now. I, I think, um, you know, in terms of maths, I was pretty rubbish at it. I actually really like it now. History, I didn't really engage with it. Like now massively, I crave my history books um, and I'm always listening to podcasts on history. Um, so I suppose the answer is those nuggets were sown in mm. my childhood but I resisted them so much. I think I was a little rebellious, not wild. I wish I had been a wild child, but I wasn't. But, you know, that learning, that, that, that pattern for learning had stood me in good stead. And it's something that, you know, I nurture now, which um, must be a result of, of, you know, my teachings. But, you know, my teachers, they were almost all women, they were almost, I remember, pretty old. So I never massively engaged with any of my teachers. They just didn't resonate with me. Not even the art teacher, not even the sports mistress. Um, so I was kind of a, a, a girl of my own devices. Like I found, you know, the swimming, there was a big swimming pool at the, at the school. I found the swimming was, was, you know, my happy place in the sports ground, the arts, the arts room. You've spoken about the sort of early academia and saying you find it difficult to sort of engage with kind of, I guess, the system in some ways. Do you think that all changed when you went to art school and kind of what age did you decide you wanted to go and kind of wanted to ask about just your time at the Surrey Institute of Art and Design? What was that experience like? And was that kind of a key moment that you were actually doing something that you enjoyed doing and you wanted to maybe pursue as a full-time career as such? The art school was my liberation. It was just a massive freeing time. I wanted to go really a long way away from home. So, you know, like a, a university in Leeds or, you know, Huddersfield or Manchester wasn't of any interest in me whatsoever. I really wanted to be somewhere near London. Um, I really wanted to escape, um, which I did. And um, not for any other reason. I think I was just always ambitious to go to different places. Um, and yeah, uh, the Surrey Institute, or it was West Surrey College of Art and Design when I was there was, was an absolute haven for me. It was a small, all arts college. Um, where I did a BA degree in fine art and um, it was heaven yeah I mean basically it was like like meeting like-minded people um, and it just had a thoroughly thoroughly enjoyable town, time there it was in a tiny village called Farnham in in Surrey um, but it, it almost didn't matter where we were it was just the energy of like being in an art space having creative people around and um, just being safe and secure and just doing what I wanted to do. I was always really good at art um, and making things and doing things, building things. I'd always done it, you know, my mum was very creative. We always sewed our own clothes. We um, painted, we made pottery, we did flowers, you know, everything. We did every, all those things at home. And, and that's really what um, honed my artistic side of my brain, I think. And, and you know, it was such a joy to be at an art, art school. 
like yourself, I went to um, an art school and obviously you're there for a period of around about three years. And then kind of the realization sinks in that when you finish, you're kind of walking out, stepping out into the kind of real world. But you did a number of kind of creative jobs in fashion and interior design before we move on and talk about your big television break. But can you just tell us about some of your earliest jobs in the creative industries and how you managed to kind of get that foot through the door initially? I think the main thing when you come out of art college, you, you're right, you're not trained just for a particular job. Or certainly I wasn't with a, a degree in fine art, but and, and teaching is an obvious route. But I wasn't sure that I wanted, to, you know, I wasn't so happy with the academic world. So I didn't really was never drawn to teaching. Um, and so, you know, I thought, you know, studio would be nice, but of course all that needs money, you know, and, and I, I was driven to earn money. Um, and I really wanted my own flat and my own car and things like that. So I think I, think I was very unsure about what I, my career was. Um, I never even contemplated interior design, which is bizarre actually, because as a kid, um, I would always be decorating. So in the summer holidays, I would decorate my grandma's house who had this lovely big doctor's house in Clayton in Bradford. And I would go there on a summer holiday to earn a bit of money putting wallpaper, you know, and this is a 12 year old kid putting wallpaper up and I loved it. And yet I was thinking, well, I wonder what shall I do as a job? You know, it's like, painting the walls I wonder what I'll do when I grow up kind of thing you know I'm thinking lord if I'd have just seen that that writing on the wall I was decorating and decorating and creating from such an early age um but I think importantly art school gave me um I mean it just gave me a massive joy initially for my three years it was really great um and it gave me a confidence for color and um, scale I was I was doing big artworks not particularly good but big scale and I think that really took me into the way I earned some money after art college was it, it was the 70s I guess and there was a big thing about paint effects and I could use paint and I wasn't afraid of scale and I wasn't afraid of putting color on walls and nothing really scared me don't think it does when you're in your 20s. And so I started doing paint effects on people's walls, friend, my own um, flat initially, because um, I'd um, got on, onto the property ladder when I was about 26 or something, which seems impossible these days. Um, so decorating my own walls and then pe people liked it, friends liked it, they saw it, they wanted something and I would decorate friends' walls. And then that really grew into the career that I had. So it gave me a lot of confidence, it gave me a bit of money. Um, paint effects were huge, so I would be doing fresco, paint effects on walls, that thing called sponging and rag rolling and uh, wood graining. I did all of those things. And so it was a massive kind of playground, really. Um, and, it, and then, you know, the penny dropped, really. It's like, this is what I love. And I, I could do this um, as, a, as a career, as a proper job. Um, so it, that's what definitely let me in. But yeah, I was doing all sorts of other things before. I mean, bar work, I worked in a gym. I sold double glazing for a while. You know, all those kind of jobs that you just kind of, you do and you kind of try on and it doesn't fit, so you shrug it off. So plenty of those kind of jobs. I even worked on the airlines for a while as cam uh, cabin crew. All good, no regrets for anything, but great when I found my, you know, where I should be. We're obviously gonna talk about the mid 1990s and obviously discuss your time on changing rooms and I, I bet you get asked about that so often, but I wanna begin with your television career because before you get the, the gig on changing rooms, initially you're working as a, a set designer on various television programs, but that was the, the point where you met your future husband. So I kind of wanted to ask you what television programs you worked on 
and a little bit about your husband's role, Chris, in the television industry. And was he kind of also a key figure in kind of helping you, you know, develop and go on to a very successful television career? Okay, so the research isn't that spot on, actually. Um, Chris, I met at art college um, before he had any role in television. Okay. Um, <clears throat> was doing fine art and we met there um, and um, we had a relationship at art college then we then we went our separate ways after college and then we re-met when I was in my late 20s um, and um, so that so that was that was great the the kind of set design it wasn't it wasn't really for television well it wasn't for television I worked for magazines quite a lot so I was doing styling work for magazines which I really loved so this was a point where I was perhaps in my early 20s mid 20s um, I'd done wool like I was saying I'd done walls in my own flat I'd designed my own flat um, and it was in a very kind of you know, we had no money, it was an unusual look. And a friend of a friend came to have drinks or something. And she happened to be a, a magazine stylist and said, um, you know, I'd love to put your decoration in the magazine. It was House Beautiful. And I said, oh yeah, that'd be absolutely thrilling. And so they put it in and then I got work at the back of that. So I would style shoots for magazines um, I would do makeovers for magazines um, and I really loved that work um, and in fact that's what the producers of Changing Rooms saw when they called me in for an interview so I done quite a few worked for quite a few magazines principally House Beautiful magazine and I guess the producers from Basil Productions which um, that was the production company that initially commissioned Changing Rooms, made Changing Rooms um, for BBC Two, interestingly. Um, they'd seen an article and thought, oh, you know, we're looking, uh, interior design shows hadn't happened on TV. So they were looking to create this show. They had the premise, they had the neighbors decorating each other's rooms. Um, and they said, so, but they were looking for designers designers that were working in the field you know not television pre um, presenters no one that had necessarily been on, been on television before um, and I got called in uh, you know they cast a net far and wide and they they caught me and I got pulled in to be interviewed prior to that I'd done a little bit of television probably because of the magazine work, because, you know, researchers are always spotting, I suppose, talent as it comes through and they're look, researching for material, especially on morning, television tel morning shows like magazine type shows. So I'd done a couple of uh, pieces for, I think it was Anne and Nick on a morning show. I'd done, um, there were, uh, I think it was, um, uh, a design show called Homefront, that's right. Um, and they commissioned me to do a mosaic feature. So I'd always been really into crafting um, as part of my upbringing, you know, being sewing, making, doing mosaic work was something I toyed around with and really liked it. And I did a feature for Homefront on mosaicing. And that was, that was kind of pivotal because that was a big piece. It was a big segment for the show. It was an evening show, I think. Um, and, you know, I thought this is, you know, I, I was nervous, really nervous. It was kind of new for me, but I liked it. I liked it a lot. And, um, and I think um, I was ready to do more television. And then when I got a call to be interviewed, I thought, you know, I'd really like this, but I'm a rank outsider. I didn't think I'd get the job, um, but obviously did. Um, so it was it was a fantastic kind of like you know the the jigsaw fitting, all the pieces pieces were fitting, you know, and it was great. It was a great time. It was nice to be on that show. Initially, you know, and we made six programs as um, we'd made a pilot initially, and the broadcasters really liked it. They commissioned six programs. So when we were making the six programs, 
I think we all knew there was something really good about this show. They've got Lawrence, they've got myself, they've got Andy Kane, who's Handy Andy, and Carol Smiley. And we all kind of knew there was something very good and very energetic about this show. And we loved doing it. And we just thought people are going to like it a lot. But then, you know, sitting on six shows before they're transmitted was, you know, it was kind of fun because people said, you know, it's going to be a big show. And it was at the time, you know, it was there was four channels. Everybody watched it. There was 13 million people watching it. It was outrageous. It was brilliant. Changing Rooms is commissioned, as you said. It becomes a, a big primetime um, television show. And culturally, it comes at a, an interesting time with big cultural and political change, I guess, in the 90s. But the question I was going to ask you, you were working with other very experienced and household names, such as Lawrence Llewellyn Bowen and Anna Richardson. You obviously worked and collaborated for a, a number of years. But my question was, was there kind of a competitive, were you quite competitive with one another on set? Because obviously there was kind of a competitive element to the show as well, or, or was it kind of just a really great time kind of collaborating and working with them? <clears throat> I wouldn't say it was competitive between the designers at all. We had, I think we were really honestly commissioned because we had very different looks uh, that, you know, Lawrence was new to television as were we all, Anna, Ryder Richardson came uh, in and uh, Graham Wynn, a beautiful designer. Um, and we were all, I guess, hired because we had a different look. So there was, it's not like, like for like, you know, yes, we were interior designers and decorators and we were creating, um, you know, our rooms, but they were very personal to us. And so people knew that, you know, when, um, Lawrence was on, for example, you know, it'd be quite a flamboyant style. When Anna was on, it'd be quite eccentric. When Graham was on, it'd be quite minimal and cool. He was, he was an incredibly experienced, he was the, probably the most experienced interior designer of all of us. And his look was very um, elegant, minimal, calm. And then there was me, I don't want to categorize myself. Um, but so there was no massive competitiveness between us. We had a really good time. We, we love we love doing it. Can I ask you about one particular episode? And I suspect you've been asked this many, many times uh, previously. I wanted to ask you about the, the teapot disaster. And for those who might not know about this, this was a, a particular incident on the show where this teapot collection, which was valued at about I think about six thousand pounds was was damaged. Um, how do you kind of look back at that particular show? Because it's almost become quite famous um, with regard to um, changing rooms. And how do you kind of look back at that? You know, in hindsight, and when it happened at the at the time. Well, when it happened, we uh, it was pretty devastating. It was right. The, I mean, changing rooms was filmed over two days so this was right at the, end of the second day there's always a big there was always a big push to get finished we were so ambitious with our designs there was never really time to um, finish everything properly and there was always a panic right at the end and I designed this um, structure it was like um, if you imagine four wires coming out of the ceiling high tensile wires with floating shelves between the wires so the shelves are suspended and it's kind of a room divider so it separated one zone from another and it was a book uh, it was a, to display her teapot collection and then right at the end I, I remember all these books coming on and loading the shelves I'm thinking gosh they're really heavy and they're getting heavier and heavier and we get panicking and loading books on until yeah the whole thing crashed out of the ceiling it was unbelievably hideous because um, all the teapots were on the shelf and and everything fell to the floor and, and it concertina us down so each floating shelf subsequently squished everything underneath it so the teapots were, were were not just in pieces they were in 
shards. And it was hideous. I mean, I, I was slightly out of the room. I was bringing things in and I heard the crash. Everybody heard the crash. It was unbelievably hideous. And I went into the room and Andy was there. And he, I mean, we were just kind of devastated. We had no words. And, but I knew I needed to earn that moment. I didn't want anyone to feel bad about they felt you know that guilt or I didn't want anyone to feel that because we take our you know the neighbors that were decorating um on their friend's house they were devastated they were in tears and they were you know so exhausted a from the filming of the program we do put people through that did put people through their paces it's um I just didn't, re I really was conscious that I didn't want anyone to feel guilt or they'd done something bad. I just wanted to earn it and say, please put all that negativity on me. I can cope with it. It's, it's my design. Yes, we overloaded the bookcase, but it doesn't matter. I'm not looking to blame anyone. I want you to just kind of rely on me. I'll take it, which I did. Um, and I went to tell um, the woman whose flat it was, whose teapot collection it was, that I destroyed really and sat down and went, this is, it's, it's, we can't get these teapots back. They're in so many little bits. It's devastating. Um, and she was very good humoured about it. She, you know, she knew there was something wrong. She thought, oh my gosh, they've killed the cat, you know. It's like, that was her first thought. I said, no, the cat's fine, the cat's fine, but the teapot collection is gone. So it, it was a dreadful moment. And, um, and I never watched that show for a long, long time. I didn't watch it being broadcast. I never wanted to catch up with that show. So I was really only forced to revisit it probably you know very pretty recently in in, in terms of uh, time probably only about six seven years ago um as people started to look back at that show and remember events from it and i don't know and then i was forced to have a look at it and it, it just reminded me of you know a very dreadful moment in the program's history um but you know it, it sh she was very good about it. Um, and that clip does keep cropping up. And I can watch it now. Uh, and there's only recently a price gone on that collection. It was never mentioned at the time. It's only, in fact, only I think this year, as Changing Rooms has been re-released, that it, the, the price has cropped up at 6,000. So, you know, it, there's a growing interest in it. And I understand that, you know, people like those television moments that go wrong. It, it was devastating and it was really sad. Um, and I felt very responsible, um, but no one was hurt and the cat was alive and we all survived to tell the tale. With regard to changing rooms, you were on the programme, I believe, for a period of six years. And in that time, Carol Smiley um, left for Pastors New. But what made you ultimately decide to leave the programme and kind of move on to new directions and just new avenues? Yeah, it was, it might have been slightly longer than six years, but you, I haven't got the figures in front of me. You, you may be right. Um, but it was, um, I'd been asked to do I'm a Celebrity, Get Me Out of Here. Um, it was their second series and I really wanted to do it. And at that time, it still exists now. There's a, a channel rivalry. We were, and, and Changing Rooms had been commissioned by the BBC and I'd worked on daytime programmes like uh, House Invaders with uh, BBC and they'd been really kind to, to me and looked after my career. But um, I'm a Celebrity was on ITV um, but I really wanted to do it. I felt as if there was a transition moment in my life where I was, perhaps in my work career as well. Changing Rooms had been on air for a long time. There was always, in those latter years, there was always a little bit of gossip around it finishing or not being recommissioned again, all that kind of gossip. And I thought that was the time 
maybe that I should branch out and ITV had offered me this this job and I wanted to do it and I did it and I remember talking to the producers of Changing Room she said well look you know they're not going to take kindly to you working on a rival channel but let's see how it goes um, so I, I remember clearly I couldn't fly out to Australia with the rest of the the cast of of I'm a Celebrity because I was filming Changing Rooms. So I filmed Changing Rooms and then I got on a plane and went to Australia and did the show. And I was really thrilled that I, in hindsight that I did do the show. It was pivotal, pivotal for me and I enjoyed it a lot. But it was that, it was really the fact that back in the day there was this immense kind of rivalry of what they called their talent, mm. funny, but um, working on right and it was that really that that sounded the the death bell the death knoll whatever that expression is it the writing was on the cards because I'd chosen to work with ITV and then continued to do so for a number of years afterwards doing lots of different shows for them and um and that was you know I came back and I think I did a few more shows but you know the channel were unhappy about that and that was, and so I, I think I missed the last series of Changing Rooms. I, I couldn't film the last series. At the beginning of the interview, I mentioned so many things that you've done throughout your career. You've listed a few already with I'm a Celebrity, Get Me Out of Here, creating your own wallpaper range, uh, a yoga DVD, working in collaboration with DFS and those adver advertising as well. But post changing rooms, what is your kind of favourite moment, would you say? And what was it like sort of taking on these new challenges? Because you've just done so much, which is incredible, really. It shows so much variety and almost that you're kind of fearless as well, that you just, you know, you just want to do so many different things creatively. It's just really interesting. Thank you. Um, I mean, my life was really busy at the back of I'm a Celebrity because, you know, I, I made it to the final and it surprised me in lots of ways because I thought I was who I was on Changing Rooms. You know, I thought that my personality came over, you know, um, I really loved my career. I loved my design. I wanted to create beautiful rooms for people to make them feel happy in those spaces. And I was as, I was as natural as I thought I could be on but when I did go on to I'm a celebrity people seemed to see a different side of me and um and that and they were very positive about that and I, that was it was lovely it was that outpouring was really wonderful as as kind of people as the longer I stayed in the jungle you know the stronger I got and I maybe saw that and voted for me to stay in or maybe they didn't vote for me to go out I forget which way I think they voted for me to stay in and um and I the longer you're in that confidence really kind of goes to your heart it sounds a bit kind of airy fairy but you know you know people are kind of keeping you in and they want to see what you're doing and actually physically in that space I grew um, because I, it's a very happy place for me. I, you know, even though I work in interiors, I'm super happy outside. And like I say, I'm like in water all the time. I'm, I'm swimming in the winter, you know, with no wetsuit. And I, I'm, you know, I'm walking barefoot in fields and forests and all of that stuff I massively love. That's from my upbringing on the farm. That's how I was as a baby. So put me in the forest in my early 30s in the in the tropical rainforest and I was really happy I mean I love bathing in the stream I loved sleeping under the stars you know um, I'm not scared of spiders or snakes or cockroaches or it, they don't terrify me so there was nothing there that was massively threatening to me and and I and I like television, I like making television, I enjoy the television process. So, you know, you put all those together and, and I was in a super chilled place and I was fortunate to be 
involved in that program with a lot of very good people, Ton, uh, Toya Wilcox, um, uh, Anthony Worrell Thompson, John Fashionu, Phil Tufnell. Um, you know, it was a great crowd of people. Um, and I resonated with them. And Phil Tufnell, Anthony Worrell Thompson and I, we, we just bonded. We created what people called the, I think it was like the Three Musketeers or something. And we became a bit naughty. You know, when you don't have any responsibilities, <laughs> you're, in, you're in the jungle and you don't have a phone, you have no connect. You become a bit like childlike. You be, we became a bit naughty and occasionally they would give us a glass of wine or something. And, not having drunk any wine for weeks, we were like giddy and silly. And, and I think people found that quite charming. <laughs> and, and I loved it. And so I got right through to the final, which was joyous, you know? It was, it was a great space. I'm a great person to be immersed in nature. And uh, I, I loved it. Today you're involved um, in publishing design books and. You write a column for the Weekend Daily Express magazine. Did you ever have an interest in pursuing a, a writing or journalistic career at all? <laughs> I don't write for the papers anymore, but you're right. I, I, I was commissioned, first of all, by the Te Sunday Telegraph magazine. No, Saturday Telegraph magazine, which was a phenomenal magazine. God, that was that was a a job that I celebrated. I met a very good friend that I'm still, you know, is one of my closest girlfriends there, journalist. I wrote for a lot of magazines in the end, including The Express, you're right. Um, I love writing. I, my first agent was a literary agent and I, to this day, I remember her saying, because I wrote articles and things. She's because you, you should you should write a book or something, Linda. And because you know, I was like, had a child, she was young, I was busy with my career, and I never gave it any thought. I just kind of laughed and went, Oh, thanks very much. That's really great. Um, but now I think it would be nice to to sit down and write. So, you know, never say never, you know. I kind of like the idea of sitting at a desk and desk and um, bashing out a few words. I'm, you know, I like the process of writing, but I still to this day, I don't give myself enough time to do that. There's always something else that will keep me busy. In this sort of current time, they've relaunched Changing Rooms, uh, a new look show for Channel 4. First of all, I was going to ask if you've obviously seen the, the new series. I was going to ask what your thoughts are. And were you initially approached to be on the, the new series at all? Um, I've, I've, I've seen parts of the new show. I was kind of thrilled that it, it was recommissioned. I thought it was quite exciting. People loved the show. People, and it gave people a beautiful kind of insight as to how interior designers work. There's been quite a few interior design shows, obviously, uh, since changing rooms and I think it's it's wonderful we're on low battery the joy of zoom um I wasn't asked to work on the new show um and I have watched some of it and uh I think it has caught elements of the the real show but um I I don't know it, it was tinged with a bit of sadness and memory because it was so phenomenal to work on. And you feel as if that moment is yours, but the moment isn't yours. People have to shine and come through and new designers come through. And it's, it's not my time. My time on that program was in the nineties. Mm. Um, and although Lawrence was on it, he's, you know, he's a super entertainer and, and, it was kind of his show, really, this new launch. Um, but I, I certainly wasn't, I didn't regret not being asked. I don't know whether I would have done it had I been asked. Possibly I would, because I love television. I love design. Um, who wouldn't want to be on Channel 4? It's a phenomenal programme responsible for the 
British Bake Off and all those phenomenal shows that everybody loves. Um, but the opportunity, the opportunity wasn't mine um, to say yes or no. Um, but there, there we go, you know. My you final, have these opportunities in life. You can go. My final question before we go on to the um, the questions I ask all our guests, our final questions before we wrap the interview is for anyone listening or watching the interview that wants to form a career in the creative industries or in interior design for you like yourself what would your advice be to them because obviously it's a very difficult industry to to get into and obviously be successful in and also do you see yourself as being a, a strong female role model with what you've achieved over the, the number of years that you have? I massively hope I'm a strong female um, role for women and men. That would be, that would be a legacy. Um, I, I think it's, it is very difficult to get into this career, um, but it's a passion career you know what I mean it's like if you have a flair for design or career and you would know it you know if you're decorating your bedroom at 10 12 that you're changing everything you know you're decorating downstairs or you're moving the furniture or you find great joy in hanging a certain set of pictures in a particular way you've got an essence of of you know a designer um, and follow it, follow your passion. That is, that's the most important thing. Don't look for success, I, I would say. Um, just follow your passion and your passion always leads you somewhere. You know, it's like, you've got it. You've got this skill in your mindset, in your body, follow it, do it, make it work for you. If you want to work on television, concentrate on that, manifest it. Maybe it'll come off, but maybe it won't. But that shouldn't be why you go into that career. Do the career because you love it. Um, and the job market is tricky, but the job market is tricky for everybody. And I mean, I feel blessed that I've done all my, most of my career in a, in a job that I absolutely love. Linda Barker, this is the part of the interview I always enjoy. I always like hearing the, uh, the answers from the guests of things they like or they're not so keen on. So these are just some quick questions just to wrap up the interview and find out things that are your passions, what you like and kind of what drives you really. So first of all, Linda, what would you say is your favorite pastime? Swimming. Going from pastime to cinema, what is your favorite film and why? Blade Runner um, because of the atmosphere and the the texture of that show the the otherworldly vibe the transportability I love your choice that's one of my favorite films of all time and I love the the Vengelis score mm. I often play that in my car it's a beautiful beautiful film yeah who's your favorite novelist <sighs> Ooh, I really like Donna Tart. Okay, if you could have chosen a different profession outside of the, the one you've worked in for so many years, what would it have been? Oh, um, oh, profession. Oh, I'd like to fly. Maybe I'd have been a pilot. Who would you say in life has been your greatest inspiration? Mm, my mother-in-law. She's passed now, but she was phenomenal. My husband's mum. Why, why was that? Was she kind of... A... She was a really beautiful woman. She lived her. She was 90. She was funny. She was intelligent. She was inquiring. She was always reading. And she was incredibly vibrant. You've written for the papers and we've discussed this briefly uh, today, but I'm going to put you on the spot here. Do you read a newspaper? And if so, which one? 
like most people, I get my news online these days, but I've started to buy a weekend paper. I love it. I love the rustle of the paper. I love the smell of the paper. And I love that time that it affords you to sit down on a sofa and turn the pages. Which weekend paper do you read normally? Oh, I have a mind. Um, I will read The Observer. I'll, I'll read The Times or The Telegraph. Uh, whichever is the thickest and usually I'll look at the supplement to see which has got the best interior pages before I buy. Moving on to the papers to food what is your favourite food? Um, I'm a very healthy eater homegrown food is the best I've just started to grow my own vegetables big salads crazy dressings loads of loads of oil um, probably probably a great big crunchy salad with lots of different leaves and textures and a very good dressing on top goat's cheese would be nice who would oh, you say I... <laughs> who would you say is your favorite cultural icon mm. cultural icon uh oh, i don't know what to say for this one um, it would be a woman of culture. Women loom strong in my life. Mm. Uh, I'm trying to think if there's sculptures, because that kind of is your instant iconic kind of reference, isn't it? I could think of Florence Nightingale, but it wouldn't be that. I think of Rosa Parks. Um, a cult, uh, just an activist of any kind. Maybe let's say Rosa Parks. We're pre the watershed, but you can say this. What would you say is your favourite curse word and why? Oh, twat. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> <laughs> what would you say is your favourite place or holiday destination? Um... Lake District is pretty awesome. I camp in the Lake District quite a lot. It's to do with the water and the mountains and the grass on my feet. Perhaps it's that. Um, moving on to music, who is your favourite music artist and what is your favourite album? Oh, lots of artists, Prince, Madonna, Debbie Harry, um, lots of women. My favorite artist, oh, sorry, my favorite album, probably Kate Bush, all of them. <laughs> and we move on to the last two questions. The first one, what would you say is your greatest achievement to date? Well, my child is pretty awesome. She's a good woman. Um, surviving is good. Being healthy in my body. My body supports everything. Um, but probably my child. And then finally, we get very deep with this question, Linda. How do you wish to be remembered? Um, someone that loves life, is positive woman. If I was a good role model, that would be awesome. Um, and a lover of people and carer of souls. I love people, I love their stories, I love old people, I love being around lots of different people, hearing their stories, and I like to look after people. I don't know if I've answered your question. Now, talking about stories, it's been interesting to trace back your career, your childhood, and thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule and taking part in your take. Um, really enjoyed 
talking to you today. I wish you all the very best for everything in the future. But can you tell us where we can find out more about what you're doing currently and, you know, if there's any kind of future projects or anything you're looking forward to that's kind of coming up in the pipeline? Um, I don't know. I guess people can find me if they look hard enough. I'm not massively into uh, self-promotion. Um, I have a few products and people can find those. Like you said, the fabrics and the blinds, that's important. My paint range is important. But you know, if people want to find me hard enough, it's not difficult these days, is it? So I'm, I'm going to let them find me. <laughs> I'm not going to. It's, it's, well, not, it's not difficult to find anyone these days. I think that's no. the problem, isn't it? If you can't, if you can't call, get a hold of someone on the phone, you can find them on Facebook or Twitter. <laughs> it's like you can't hide from anyone these days, I think. Yeah, exactly, exactly. But yeah, thanks a lot for um, joining us. I've been interested Thank to hear your story, what you've achieved, and I wish you more continued success and thank you for being honest and thank you for joining us on your take it's a pleasure and continued good luck with the the your take podcast thank you kindly Bye.